good afternoon. Um, I'd just like to start by thanking the Sloan Foundation for supporting this symposium, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Hoisington for um, organizing it, and everybody who was involved uh, with organizing the symposium with him. Um, thank you, and thank you for inviting me. I'm, I'm excited to be here sharing some of the results of a study we recently completed. Um, I have the privilege of uh, telling you about this study, but I want to point out that it was really a collaborative effort uh, between uh, my colleagues at the Army Research Institute of Environmental Medicine, um, collaborators in the Norwegian Defense Forces, and then also colleagues at the Army Center um, for Environmental Health Research. So just by way of background, I work in the Military Nutrition Division at the Army Research Institute of Environmental Medicine. And what our research mission is, is really to look at the intersection of human nutrition and physiology and develop ways of feeding our soldiers um, to, to optimize their health and performance. So the gut microbiome really falls into this, this nutrition, um, more fighter performance um, intersection. So the overarching aim of a lot of our research to include the study I'll tell you about today is to understand how what, we, what we're defining as operational stressors, uh, so things that our military, our warfighters are exposed to um, that are fairly unique to them and they often experience them in combinations, which makes them very different than a lot of civilian populations. Things like rapid changes in diet composition going from eating a normal diet to eating nothing but MREs. Um, energy deficit, so that's a concept of not eating enough calories to maintain your body weight. We commonly see soldiers in the field losing uh, lean body mass because they can't eat enough. Um, sleep deprivation, prolonged physical activity, climatic extremes. All these operational stressors have in one way or another been linked uh, to the microbiome and to health outcomes, um, mostly in, in, in animal models. So we're looking at how these all come together to influence the bidirectional com communication between uh, the microbiome and the gut and the host to ultimately influence warfighter health. One of the health outcomes we're interested in is this concept of uh, intestinal permeability. Dr. Bremner mentioned it earlier. Um, the reason we're interested in this is because the intestinal epithelium really is at the interface between the gut microbiome and human health. Um, in a normal healthy state, that barrier functions to let good stuff in and keep bad stuff out. However, in a damaged state, what happens is pores open up between cells and they, don't, they aren't as selectively permeable to unwanted compounds. So um, unwanted compounds such as uh, bacterial uh, lipopolysaccharide and other antigens can get into circulation, cause inflammation, unwanted inflammation, potentially cause GI distress. Um, impact cognition and performance and have a variety of other health effects. So we're interested in this concept of how, how intestinal permeability um, comes into play. The study I'm going to tell you about today um, encompasses all that. We're interested in this multi-stressor uh, military training environment. So what happens when you take warfighters who are being exposed to a combination of these stressors, take them out in the field, how does that impact their microbiome, what the microbiome is doing, and then also some health outcomes. Um, so this was a, a study we did in Norway with, our, with Norwegian soldiers as part of their normal training program. Um, they were participating in a 51-kilometer cross-country ski march, which took them four days to complete. Um, we designed the study to look at different feeding strategies for maintaining uh, body weight and muscle mass in the field. So there's three diet groups. Uh, they're not as relevant to this talk, but I'll point them out um, because they'll show up again in the graphs. Uh, we had a control group that received three Norwegian rations a day. Um, we had uh, two supplement groups, a carbohydrate supplement group and a protein supplement group, who, either received, who both received the three Norwegian rations, but then additionally either a, a protein supplement, uh, four bar, uh, energy bars a day, or a carbohydrate-based energy bar. Uh, we took urine, stool, and blood samples before and during or after the training, um, and we, we used food logs to measure exactly. We provided them their food, and uh, we can measure pretty much exactly what they were eating during this, during this march. Um, we used the stool samples to look at microbiota composition and also uh, metabolite profiles. Uh, so this, uh, the sequencing work was done by uh, colleagues at the uh, Army Center for Environmental Health Research. We looked at the V3, V4 region of the 16S gene, 
Uh, ultimately, that gave us 83 genera and 12 phyla to look at in our analyses. Uh, we shipped samples to Metabolon to do stool metabolomics. They use a variety of UPLC, MS, MS methods. They were able to identify 694 compounds in our samples. And then my, my colleagues at the Army Center for Environmental Health Research really came up with a, uh, a nice way to try to determine which metabolites were changing due to changes in microbiota composition. They used a program called PyCrust, which some of you are pr uh, probably familiar with, but it infers uh, metagenomic uh, information from the 16S data. Uh, so by looking at changes in 16S profiles, you can infer changes in metagenomes. And from that, and using other publicly available databases, you can make inferences about which stool metabolites were changing because of changes in intestinal microbiota composition. And then we looked at intestinal permeability, and we did this to, using what's called a sugar absorption test. Um, I'll just briefly exp explain how this works. Um, basically, like I mentioned, in the healthy state, the gut is selectively permeable. So if you give certain artificial sweeteners, we use sucralose in this case, uh, that sucralose shouldn't be passing into your bloodstream and it shouldn't be coming out in your urine. However, in a damaged state, when those cells become more permeable, pores open up, and what happens is sucralose or another artificial sweetener that you could use uh, get into the bloodstream and it's excreted by the kidneys. So by measuring, in this case, urine over 24 hours, collecting all urine produced in that time, and measuring how much sucralose is in there, we get an idea of how permeable the gut is. And if, if you're interested, there's other artificial sweeteners you can use to probe different regions of the GI tract. Sucralose and 24-hour urine gives you a measure of whole gut permeability. Um, I want to point out one um, particularly important thing here. Um, this is just uh, some, some information on our study population and how many calories they were burning and what they were eating. Um, so we, we have this concept, concept of an energy deficit that we constantly see in military personnel and training. Again, that means they're not eating enough energy to match their, cal their energy expenditure. So these guys were burning about 6,000 calories per day, which is at least double uh, what most of us in this room are burning on a daily basis. They were eating 2,500 to 3,000 calor calories a day, which is probably pretty similar to what some of us are eating. Um, but because of that high energy expenditure, um, their substantial energy deficit, um, there was a re the result was a substantial energy deficit. And this presents a huge physiologic burden on the body and was one of the primary stressors in this study although this is overlaid on top of prolonged physical activity, uh, very cold weather, um, working under a load, um, sleep deprivation, and probably also some psychological stress. Um, so on to the results. I'll point out the graph on the left. We saw an increase in permeability. Uh, so again, the y-axis is sucralose excretion, which is an intestinal permeability. Saw a 63% uh, increase in permeability. And that was positively associated with the change in inflammation. We looked at uh, IL-6 uh, and the plasma as a marker of inflammation. Um, I'm not going to make any causal infer inferences here. We can't determine cause and effect. Likely, there's a bidirectional relationship where increases in intestinal permeability may cause some inflammation, but inflammation may also cause increases in intestinal permeability. We saw a, a pronounced impact on the intestinal microbiome. Uh, this is a PCOA plot. You've seen a few of these today. Um, these circles are microbiome, microbiota compositions of soldiers before training. The diamonds are after training. Um, you can clearly see the separation, points closer together, more similar. Distinct separation in intestinal microbiota composition. Uh, we actually saw changes in relative abundance of 75% of the phyla that we measured and 58% of the genera that we measured. Uh, the phyla level changes are presented on this graph here. Um, what was interesting is we only saw a decrease in one phyla, Bacteroidetes, um, and an increase in relative abundance in most other phyla uh, to include some of the uh, less dominant taxa at the beginning of training. We didn't see as pronounced effects in the stool metabolome. Uh, so there's a PCA plot here of the stool metabolite profiles. There's no clear separation by time point or by diet in this case. Nonetheless, we did see um, uh, changes in, in, in levels of 39% of the metabolites we measured in stool. And we were able to link 25% of those to changes in intestinal microbiota composition using the pipeline I mentioned earlier. So what we wanted to know was, was the microbiome contributing to this increase in intestinal, uh, intestinal permeability that we measured? 
And to do this, we looked at what was the state of the intestinal microbiota before training, and was that related to changes in intestinal permeability? And we found that there were a few signals suggesting that the pre-training microbiota was related to this increase in intestinal permeability. So if you look at the two graphs on the top there, these are signals that were associated with lower increases in intestinal permeability. So a higher diversity before training and a higher relative, a higher relative abundance of actinobacteria before training was associated with a lower increase in intestinal permeability during training. Conversely, if you look at the bottom two graphs, a higher relative abundance of uh, proteobacteria and a higher relative abundance of Sudorella, two uh, known pro-inflammatory taxa, were associated with larger increases in intestinal permeability during training. We wanted to do the same thing with the stool metabolite profiles. So we looked at changes in stool metabolite concentrations and how those related to changes in intestinal permeability. Uh, we found a number of signif significant associations which are listed here, and I just want to point out um, four important molecules highlighted in green and yellow. Uh, the two highlighted in green are secondary bile acids that are known to be produced by um, intestinal bacteria. Decreases in these uh, intestinal bio, uh, secondary bile acids were associated with larger increases in intestinal permeability. And there is evidence to suggest that secondary bile acids do play a role in mediating gut barrier integrity. Uh, cysteine and arginine are amino acids. I highlight these in yellow because these were two amino acids that were uh, linked to changes in intestinal microbiota composition using our bioinformatics pipeline. What's really interesting about these two amino acids is they're both precursors for compounds known to or thought to impact gut barrier integrity. Uh, cysteine is an imp important component of glutathione, which is an antioxidant, and arginine is essential for nitric oxide, which is an important vasodilator, and it also has some other roles um, in, the, in the gut health. So I just wanted to summarize briefly. Um, the key findings were that military training resulted in an increase in intestinal permeability and inflammation, and, and these changes were uh, observed concomitant to changes in intestinal microbiota composition and metabolism. Um, a higher microbiota diversity and a higher actinobacteria relative abundance before training, and a lower, uh, I should say, proteobacteria and Sudorella relative abundance um, before training were associated with higher, uh, larger increases um, in intestinal permeability during training. And then changes in cysteine and arginine, two amino acid precursors of compounds known to or thought to influence uh, gut barrier integrity, were also associated uh, with the intestinal microbiota and with the changes in intestinal permeability. Uh, so to conclude, we think these findings demonstrate that a multi-stressor uh, military training environment has, can have deleterious effects on intestinal barrier integrity, and this can observe, uh, this, this occurs concomitant to changes in intestinal microbiota composition and metabolism. Um, so what we feel is these, provide, these findings start to provide support um, for potentially targeting the pre-training microbiota as a way to uh, mitigate some of the decrements in intestinal permeability uh, we observed here. Of course, more studies are needed, um, but preliminary evidence nonetheless. So that's really the, in the wheelhouse of our group. Being from the military nutrition division, our goal is to develop better ways of feeding our soldiers, as I mentioned. Uh, so we think this provides us ammunition to start help, to help us design uh, nutritional-based approaches targeting the microbiota um, in soldiers going into training or combat scenarios. Um, I'd just like to conclude by thanking the study team, uh, in particular the, the study PI, Dr. Stefan Pasiakos, um, and acknowledge um, our colleagues at the Norwegian Defense Forces um, and the U.S. Army Center for Environmental Health Research, who are all integral in, in finish, uh, getting the study done. Thank you.